I just wanted to thank you and the Hudson Library for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm so honored to be talking with Kathy Reichs, like the legend. So this is going to be such a fun night. I have so many questions. Um, but before we begin, you know, just to reiterate, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will be monitoring as we go along. And um, Kathy, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Well, I thank you. It's <laughs> so nice. I loved your new book. I absolutely enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. I've got so many questions. Um, so I'd like to just dive right in. I want to hear all about the inspiration uh, for this latest installment in Tempe Brennan's story. I understand some of it was inspired by a real case. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the story opens with the discovery of a badly mangled body. It's been scavenged by feral hogs, which we do have in North Carolina. That idea came to me. So he has no face, he has no hands, so you've got no dental ID, you've got no fingerprints, so it's a typical forensic anthropology case. The idea came to me, um, I worked on a murder investigation. There was a journalist in Ottawa who went missing and several months later, her body was found in a heavily wooded area um, and it had been badly scavenged by bears. So the idea of having the badly scavenged body came from that. Um, that was bears, this is feral hogs. That's just, I love the science behind what you do. I'm sure the audience here, they love it too. It's so exciting to hear everything told from such a professional and impressive point of view. Um, but I'm also just, from a writing standpoint, I'm so impressed with how new and unexpected the story felt. And I'm just curious, after 19 books in the same series, how do you keep the series fresh? How do you keep the ideas new? Well, that's why in this one, I decided to shake it up a bit. And Tempe's in a place she's never been before. Um, she has been, just before the story opens, she's been diagnosed with an unruptured cerebral aneurysm, which is surgically corrected. But she's having some lingering post-surgical, maybe the medications, whatever. She's having migraine headaches. And she, for the first time ever in her life, she can't completely trust her own perceptions and she's not used to that. So through that at her, also we learned in a story called First Bones, which appeared in an anthology called The Bone Collection, that her longtime boss uh, in Charlotte at the medical examiner's office, Tim Larrabee, was murdered. So there's a new boss in town and the woman hired to be the chief ME in Charlotte, she and Tempe have history and this woman can't stand her and she has sworn that Tempe will never enter the medical examiner office again. So when this faceless corpse turns up, Tempe, it's a typical forensic anthropology case, as I said, but this woman is not going to invite Tempe to do the consult on it. And Tempe is convinced this pathologist, Margot Hevner, is making serious mistakes. So she being Tempe, she decides she's going to pursue it on her own. So she's working outside the system in this book, and that's new for her as well. I think it's just fascinating to see the ins and outs of how do you skirt an investigation, like how does she get information? Um, but I had a specific question about this dispute between Tempe and her new boss, which you nickname sometimes Dr. Morg or Dr. Death. Um, and the dispute is over ethics, which I found fascinating, especially given the fact that you're still a practicing forensic, pathol um, forensic anthropologist. So I'm just curious, um, what inspired this ethical conflict? And if you ever personally experienced these types of ethical conflicts in your work? Well, she and uh, I have not personally, um, but one of the themes of the book, one of the themes for Tempe on her personal level, as I said, is how can she sort out what's real and what's not real? And she's having a little trouble with that. The broader theme of the book is the same. What is real and what is not real? Because we are all living in a day and age when we're constantly bombarded with all kinds of misinformation and disinformation um, from, you know, anyone can put out a blog or a podcast or get online or get on the air and say whatever they want. And, and sometimes it's people in positions of authority. So how does the average person sort through all of that? So one of the reasons that Tempe has a conflict with this 
woman is that in the past she she writes books she writes novels uh, not novels she writes um general audience case study kind of forensic pathology books that's why she calls herself dr morg um, and in the past she agreed to promote her books by going on a conspiracy theorists radio show and blog and she said things that she should not have said she revealed information about a child homicide she should not have revealed she also this uh rather controversial uh blogger was an anti-vaxxer and this woman who's a trained medical doctor did not contradict him so tempe not only saw it as unethical she saw it as dangerous and she spoke out and this woman holds a grudge years later still and now she's the boss <laughs> isn't that just the way it goes sometimes what? um i was so i mean i was fascinated in looking through your your catalog your backlist um you don't shy away from controversy like the anti-vaxxer movement or conspiracy theorists um or talk radio uh given our moment right now of these extremely divisive politics and these very tense times are you concerned about reader reaction to you taking on maybe a slightly controversial subject? And how has um, response been? It's been positive. I had a, I've had a few comments, people that said, well, authors shouldn't get political. Um, okay, fine, they're entitled to that opinion. But um, I do like the books to have a little broader, um, a, a little more serious social question. Of course, the bottom line is a good story. These are murder mysteries and, you know, they have to move along quickly. They have to have plot twists. Everything has to make sense. Um, but I like to have a little bit of a broader theme as well. I've had uh, books that dealt with human trafficking. I've had books that dealt with trafficking and endangered species. So I do try to look, I've had books that dealt with human rights abuses, the Guatemala, uh, Grave Secrets, the Guatemala book. So I do like to have a, it's not new for me to take a, a theme, to have a theme that's a little uh, contemporary. What's on people's minds right now? Well, and I applaud that. I think it really made it more relevant and more of the moment. And I was just drawn immediately into that part of the story. But as an author myself, you know, dealing with readers, I know that it can be a little bit choppy in the waters sometimes um, when we touch on something controversial. Uh, back to our discussion a second ago about you know, this um, fictional character reusing an open case or referring to a real crime. Um, sometimes you are inspired by real world cases and, and for, your, for your work. And I'm just curious how you draw the line between fact and fiction and, and where is that line for you? Yeah, I do use actual case. I use the core idea from actual cases, just the central Nugget. For example, in Deja Dead, um, I had just worked on a serial murder case when I wrote that book. And that was a, uh, one of the victims had been dismembered and the pattern of, normally I'm asked, well, what kind of tool was it? Can you tell us what kind of tool from the marks and the bones? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and in that case, it was just a straight edge knife. So I couldn't give them any information about tool category, but I could tell them that the perpetrator had gone about the dismemberment in a very unique way. And that ended up being um, telltale testimony in court. So I decided to use that core idea, changed all the names, all the places, the number of victims, the gender of the victim, whatever, but use that central idea of <clears throat> what if there was details about the dismemberment that could lead to finding the perpetrator. So I do use cases, um, but I always change the names and the dates and the, the as I said, the places and just, and I also don't use cases unless they've been uh, public knowledge. It's either been a court, uh, a trial, so it's, it's a court transcripts or public knowledge, or it's been in the media. No, that makes sense. I mean, I write some things that involve real crime and it's always a really fine line. You can kind of dance around when you're, when you're writing. So I love Deja Dead, by the way. I read that as well. And all of the very <laughs> intricate descriptions of the knife marks that you were referring to and different saws and how these things affect bones, I was just riveted. What do most authors get wrong when they are talking about forensic pathology or forensic anthropology? Oh, most authors get 
something wrong. Um, <laughs> and there are resources. Uh, we don't expect you to be a forensic pathologist or a forensic anthropologist, but you know where to go. Uh, one of the most valuable sites for a writer, well, anybody that wants to learn about it would be, um, our professional body is called the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And there are, I forget how many sections, but each section, uh, there's the, the dentists and the anthropologists and the forensic engineers have their section and the pathologists. And so at the website, you can go, I think it's aafs.org, and you can contact specialists in all these different areas. If you're interested in forensic anthropology, our certifying board is the American Board of Forensic Anthropology, abfa.org, I think it is. And um, you, can, you can go there and you can, there are actually direct links to, to all of us who are board certified, who are the, re, you know, the real deal, real players in the field. And you can, you can throw us a question and you know, we're not gonna write you a treatise on it, but um, we'll, we'll be happy to, to give you an answer. Since you began publishing and be, you know, become known as this uh, world renowned expert, do you get a lot of questions from authors and people wanting to know more about your field? I get some. I wouldn't say I get a lot, but I get some. Um, some through my website, uh, occasionally through the ABFA site. So when you get an email from me, it won't be a shocker. I'm going to call it. <laughs> I'm going to send you an email. But I'll, like, I'm I'm gonna... I'll get questions <laughs> like, okay, if my, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a question that has nothing to do with forensic anthropology. And I'm often, you know, it'll be like, what kind of beetle would be the first one to burrow in? And no, you need an entomologist. You know? <laughs> no, I'm coming to you with axes and knives and saws. Okay. okay. It's good to know. <laughs> need a cut mark, uh, I mean, a tool mark uh, expert. Yes. Well, I just, I, I find so many things fascinating about the way you break down the science. But could you tell us about the research that went into Conspiracy of Bones? Because you touch on some stuff I know nothing about. You talk about the deep web, you're talking about steg steganography, and I hope I'm saying that right. Yes, um, yeah. some of it I knew nothing about. Um, steganography, I had, I had to find myself. I Googled it and found myself an expert in that area. Sometimes I will have read an article, I will have come across an article and think, wow, that is great stuff. I'm gonna use that in a book and then I may contact the author. Um, so I'm, what else is in this book? Let me think. The, the conspiracy theory. Somebody once said you should be able to summarize your book, like your elevator pitch in Hollywood. You should be able to summarize your book in uh, five bullet points. So I guess my five bullet points would be there's the, a brain lesion, um, a faceless corpse, uh, a conspiracy theorist. Um, what would be another one? Exploitation of the vulnerable would be another one. That's the twist ending. We can't go into yes, that. Yes, we're not, we're not going to reveal anything here, folks. But I do want to know, did you really go on the deep web when you were doing your research? I did. I did. I downloaded the Tor browser. It may still be on this computer. I'll have to check. Um, I did. I prowled around down there. A lot of the material, and I give some of the statistics, um, which I had to look up. Like there's 95 times more material on the dark web than there is on the surface web. That normal browsers don't go there. Firefox and Safari don't don't go there. Um, but anybody can download Tor and go down there. But a lot of it you have to have, uh, as in the story, you have to have uh, passwords and usernames. And it was fascinating, and I love the fact that like Tempe was just the way I would be. Like, ah, my computer's probably infected. I'm sure if I had gone on the dark web, I would have thrown it out the window. Yeah. Did you feel like you had to do anything to increase your own personal security when you were doing some of this research? No, not really. Um, no. <laughs> you you didn't wrap your head in tinfoil? Because <laughs> you can go anonymously. Nobody knows who you are. Although I suppose there are these uh, malwares that can be, you know, tracked to your computer and put a little camera in your, or reverse your camera. Or, so yeah, I, I was... The technology that was in this story blew my mind and it made me curious, um, are you a bit of a techno buff yourself or did you have to go find people who like spend their time doing this? I'm competent, um, but no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, a 12 year old techie. I, I couldn't begin <laughs> to that. But I love that you have a character that's mama 
who's very interested in computers. Like I, I was very, I hope that, don't think that gives too much away because she's no, such no, a- met Daisy in earlier books. Um, Daisy was, Daisy is, uh, I guess we'd call her bipolar. When, when she was going through this years ago, they didn't. But um, one time when she was um, in recovery, I guess, she, I don't know what you call it. Um, Tempe bought her a computer thinking, well, she, you know, she'll maybe play with this. And she loved it and she took every course imaginable and she became this absolute rock star. Um, on the internet and, and anything online. I, it was so unexpected. It was like, cause usually in stories that involve a technical expert, it's like a teenage kid with tattoos, smoking five cigarettes at once. Um, I was, it was such a fresh perspective. And I wanted to ask, I love that your books feature older, dynamic, active female characters. It's been like, like mom or Daisy. And I'm just curious, does your publisher ever push you to write younger characters because of our youth obsessed culture or have they completely embraced this? They have um, completely embraced it. They've never pushed me to do anything other than turn in, you know, where's the manuscript kind of thing. Right. But um, no, um, I'm, I started out with Scribner. I did my first 16, I think, books with Scribner and then I, I sw switched publishers and I've now gone back to Scribner. So um, no, they've never put, the way I work uh, traditionally is that I write the book um, somewhere along the way they say could you could you tell us what it's about we need to do some marketing and cover art and that kind of thing and I do or I might even send them the first six chapters or something and then I, I write the book I finish it I turn it in it's complete um, and the editing is never has never so far I should knock on wood but so because I'm wrapping up the next one right now. Um, the editing has never been very, oh gosh, it would take me, I don't know, a couple of weeks maybe. It's never been terribly hard. I love that because I find that, you know, interesting female characters that are dynamic and, and exciting and sexually active and, you know, having romantic interests, like we tend to, as our culture, we don't focus on every woman in that scenario. We tend to get a little bit youth obsessed. And I, I just love that about your, your books. I think that it's exciting to see women in such empowered roles. So thank you. Um, I am going through, and I'm curious if I, our, read, our listeners here may not know that Cleveland is home to the world's largest documented collection of modern human skeletal remains at the Hammond Todd Human Osteological Collection at the Natural oh, History Museum. Is that a, a Case Western? Is that where it's it is? It's at the Natural History Museum next to Case Western. Okay, okay, yeah. And the reason why I bring it up is because I got to tour it last year with Sisters in Crime, and it's just 3,000 cadaver skeletons yes. that they have in the basement of the museum in drawers. Okay. Yes. And um, they were collected, they were mostly indigent, homeless people from 1912 to 1938. And I was just curious if you've used the collection, if you've ever visited it, um, I think if I you have any thoughts that, on it. I think I did use that collection, part of that collection uh, when I did my dissertation, my master's or dissertation work. I think I did. I did, I was in Columbus though, so maybe I'm not. <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> I a it's lot a of skeletons. I think it was in Columbus, Ohio though. I had no idea that we just had 3,000 skeletons under our museum. It was really bizarre to go and see it. So I was picturing that while I was reading the story. And I'm curious, looking at all of that, why did you choose forensic anthropology? Obviously, you had a great aptitude. What was it about bones that really sucked you into the profession? Well, I chose bones, but I didn't choose forensic anthropology. It kind of chose me. Um, my PhD was in bioarchaeology. I was looking at ancient archaeologically recovered skeletons. I was interested in paleopathology, paleo -demo demographics, that kind of thing. But back in the day, and I will not tell you how far back that was, um, before board certification and before, how do you know who's a legitimate expert? When police were finding bones, they, what do we do with them? Well, let's take them to the bones lady out at the university. So, and if this is in the, there's a, that same story I referenced earlier called First Bones. It's kind of an origin story for Tempe. And it's an origin story based on my own origin story because I was happily doing my archeology, span archeologically derived skeletons and police started bringing me cases. So that I just was really, I really enjoyed doing um, 
the forensic work. Um, I love archaeology and it's fun when I get a case that turns out to be archaeological, takes me back to my roots. But it's, I really enjoyed the relevance of the forensic work when you, you can't be wrong. When you give an answer to a family and tell them you've identified their missing loved one or, or, or you testify in court, you're going to impact someone's life, which you're not going to do in archaeology. You know, you get into long discussions with your colleagues in the literature, but you're not going to change anyone's life. So I really liked that. I went back, I retrained, I sat for my board exams, and um, I've been doing the forensics ever since. I love that they just came looking for you. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, and that, that scene in, in uh, First Bones is, <laughs> yeah. She well, was going to have to, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting that next, because that's going to be fascinating. Uh, well, obviously, that transition was kind of, uh, you know, it was just sort of came in your lap, but writing a novel is quite a different thing. Yes. And <laughs> I get this question all the time, having been an engineer, what in the world inspired you to write a book? And um, I would love to hear a little bit about your transition from scientist to author. and. Um, what inspired you along the way? Well, a couple things came together in the mid 90s. I made full professor at the university, so that's the highest rank. So I was free to do whatever I wanted to do. <clears throat> I had just finished working on the serial murder case that I mentioned in Montreal. So I had <clears throat> a good idea for a story and I had the freedom to try something new. And I didn't feel like writing another textbook or a journal article. So I thought I would, I would try fiction. I also thought it was a way to bring my science to a broader audience. Nobody had heard of forensic anthropology back in, in the early, you know, prior to maybe the mid nineties or so. Um, so all that came together and, and I thought I'd give it, a, give it a try. I have no training in writing. I just um, tried to write the kind of book I like to read. Well, I love that. I do the same thing. I'm curious, who were you reading at the time that oh. maybe inspired you to take that next step? You know, I don't remember who I was reading at the time, but I know I like the darker, the grittier, the more um, muscly, I guess, kind of not the tea cozy. Um, I, I admire Agatha Christie and, you know, some of the, the grand old masters in the field, but I do like the darker procedural. So it might have been Michael Connemy, I, I might have been reading at the time, Ian Rankin. Um, gosh, who else? <laughs> I always go blank when somebody asks me, who do you like to write? <laughs> Did you read any um, in, like instructional guides? As an, I'm an engineer, so I must have read three or four how to write a novel books because I wanted a manual. And I'm curious, was there anything that helped? Um, I did. My agent at the time said, you know, don't ever say that in an interview. Because <laughs> she <laughs> how do you do this? And I said, well, I got a book, how to write a mystery and how to write a novel. Um, it, they were a little useful. There were, you know, there was one or two pointers in each of them that, that was valuable. What do you find more challenging, writing nonfiction, like um, for your profession, or writing the fictional stories? They're challenging in different ways. Uh, I remember when writing the first book and I'd be writing along and then I'd stop and think, well, can I say that? Do I have to cite that? And I think, no, I, I can say whatever I want. I'm making this up. You know, it has to be <laughs> authentic and it has to be, the science has to be legitimate, um, plausible as we would say in the writer's room. Uh, but otherwise you, you have the freedom to just, to just make it up. So, while I do equal, probably equal amounts of research um, for both, um, there's a freedom to writing fiction that I enjoy a lot. People love the saying, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And I know you've seen some strange things in the lab. Would you say that your real life cases exceed um, credulity? Like, could you write some of the cases that come across your desk or do you think people would have a hard time believing them? Um, well, that after 246 or whatever episodes of Bones, I think people would, you know, they'd say, yeah, okay, I get it. The body was in a bar of chocolate. Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. That's hard. As it got into season, you know, seasons 9, 10, 11, and 12, we'd be sitting in the writer's room going, because every episode would begin with the body compromised human remains. So we'd say, okay, let's put it in a bar of chocolate. And then we go, Oh no, wait, we did that in season two. All right, let's 
<laughs> Let's smash it behind the bleachers in the high school gym. Yeah. Oh no, we did that in season four. Or you know, it got harder and harder to find up new and novel ways to to mess up a set of human remains. That's so. Then, do you find when you're writing your novels that you've tapped out some of the options? If you've you've been in that writing room, how did you manage to make this one so fresh? Oh, you know, well, it's when I when I start thinking about a new book, which I do when I'm about two thirds of the way through whatever current book I'm writing. It's like it's it's like vegetable soup. There's all of this stuff floating around in my head. Maybe I wrote read an article on human genome editing, and then maybe I just visited, uh, I don't know, uh, the Dominican Republic, and then maybe I just, you know, a colleague told me about a set of remains that came out of the, uh, the sh belly of a shark or something. You know, so it's all swimming around like that, and maybe I just read an article or, or went to a presentation at a professional meeting on a new technology, methodology, and you know, as it swims around, then it just kind of congeals into a story idea, which is very, very ill-formed initially. Uh, and I'm not, I'm more of a pantser than a plotter. So I may do some, I know where the story's gonna go, and I know what characters I'm gonna use. I know what, I pick what kind of, what science is gonna drive the solution, because I, you know, it's a murder mystery, but the solution is driven by science rather than just, legwork, good old fashioned legwork and intuition. You know, so I've got all that, but then I'll maybe outline six or eight chapters and then I just start start writing. I love that. I, I, I have a similar process myself. So it's always reassuring to hear very successful writers say stuff like that. I'm like, good. <laughs> Do you find that it was um, helpful to your writing to stay involved in the forensic sciences, even though you oh, may absolutely. have- yeah because it was constantly, I'm not any longer, there came a point where something had to give. I was writing an adult novel, a young adult novel with my son and a screenplay every year. So something had to give. So um, I, I have pretty much pulled back from doing any, any forensic casework, um, but very much so. And, and the fact that I spent decades in the autopsy room and at crime scenes and you know in the, in the crime lab, because ours was a complete, medical, legal, and crime lab. And I was surrounded by, you know, the biologists and the pathologists and the fire and arson guys and the bomb specialists and the hair and fiber specialists. So any time, so you're always hearing about cases, even though they're not your own. And any time I needed help with any particular um, aspect of forensic science, they were always there willing, you know, willing to help me. One of the things I love about your series is the two locations being in North Carolina and then also getting to visit Montreal, which I've always wanted to visit. And I know you've lived there. Um, how would you compare crime fighting in, in the general process of solving a case in Canada versus the United States? Is it a very different process or how no, do the rules vary? The process, the process is the same. Um, the kind of crime varies a bit. I mean, <laughs> We have way more gunshot deaths here than than in Canada for obvious reasons, but um, I and the other another difference is that and Canadians are always stunned by this. They 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 can't wrap their right mind around the fact that we have 50 different sets of laws. You know, each state has its. We have federal law, of course, but each a criminal law in Canada is uniform all across the country. So how can you have 50 sets of criminal law in 50 different states kind of thing? So that that's a difference. You know, and as we're talking, I'm sure you're following some of, you know, true crime and, and things that are happening in DNA evidence lately. There's been such an evolution of technology in solving crime since you started writing this series to now, and obviously your series has done a great job keeping up with the times, but as a crime solver, like what do you think some of the biggest breakthroughs have been since you started the series to, to today as far as improvements in our technology? DNA, without a question, you know, DNA. And that's one of the things that in this book, Skinny Slide, she's working with Skinny Slidell, and who's one of my favorite characters. In He's great. Yeah, I really like Skinny. Um, but she's explaining to him, uh, he says, wait a minute, for years you've told me that the only thing you can use DNA for is comparison, that you, if you have an unknown and you have a possible, you, you, know, you can compare your sample from your unknown to an unknown person. Now you're telling me you can actually 
determine what somebody looks like or what racial background they might have. And that's a big development um, in that uh, it's now predictive. It's not just comparative. And you can predict things like hair color and eye color and broad geographic ancestry. And then, of course, this whole new area of genetic genealogy as well. This is a whole new thing that we didn't even have, what, five years ago. Yeah, them solving the Golden State killings was quite exciting in the last two years. Like, I was following that case very closely, but it, it's just been stunning just to read the first book in the series and then this 19th book, how much technology has changed. Cell phones and communications and email and the internet. Like, it's, it's just like a different world. Yeah, and I don't remember very well. In the book I'm writing now, I couldn't remember back in 2000, did we, what did we have in 2000? That's only 20 years ago, but we were still using camcorders, right? And doing cassette tapes, right? I think. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so happy to have the internet to help me remember. Exactly. Things I'm, like that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of so, thinking about the past, but then looking to the future, what's next for Tempe Brennan? Well, I am working on the next book, um, number 20. Uh, I'm doing a lot, what can I tell you about it? It's called The Bone Code. Um, little departure in title, not much, a little. And um, it'll be out March 16th. I <laughs> was stunned to get an email to me saying, pre-order your new Kathy Reichs book out March 16th. I said, huh, really? It's <laughs> soon. Better finish this thing. <laughs> quick. <laughs> and uh, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, so what, am I, what can I tell you about it? Um, I am doing a lot of research into human genome editing. Let me just leave it at that. That sounds fascinating. I'm just looking for I something, feel something that'll be in people's minds. You know, because when you start a book, it's two years down the road, it's going to come out a year writing it and then a year and kind of in, in production. So what's going to be on people's minds? Yeah, it's really impressive how timely the stories stay, like as you're going along through the series. Um, the Bones television series has has wrapped and I know 12 seasons is, is amazing. What a success. Um, looking back on it, would you have done anything differently? And, and do you have plans for another adaptation in the future? Well, I, I would not have done anything differently because we are to this day the longest running scripted drama in the history of the Fox Network. I mean, that's, yeah, so we did something right. <laughs> people liked it, people watched it. Um, so, and plus I wouldn't presume to say I would do something different because I was a very, very lowly producer and writer. I would write an episode, you know, every year in the later seasons. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's very likely that, given that we were on air for 12 years, I don't think it's very likely there'll be another adaptation of, um, of the T Temperance Brennan books. I suppose possibly a feature film, but I don't know. We'd have to see how David and Emily feel about that. Um, but, you know, maybe the viral series. I did write this young adult series with my son, Brendan, and we did six books in the viral series. You know, so it's, there is a, one producer now I'm talking to about possibly developing that. I, I'm so impressed that you were able to do a collaborative project with your son. I have two sons, now they're much younger, but the idea of trying to even just bake cookies is a challenge, so I'm impressed. Well, plus he's that an editor, he's a lawyer. So, you know, our editorial meetings could be, Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> a little tense. <laughs> uh, is that series still ongoing? Are you still? Um, no, he, we did six books uh, and then he dumped me. He, uh, <laughs> he, he moved on. He did a series called uh, Nemesis, Nemesis Genesis Crystallis, that series, which skewed a bit older than Virals. Uh, Virals features Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece and her best three best friends who are boys. What would ha one of the things that was happening is parents would ask me, is it okay at you know, my readings or whatever, is it okay if my daughter reads your books? And I'd say, your adult books. And I'd say, well, how old is your daughter? And they'd say seven, you know, and I'd say, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is dead bodies. <laughs> no, 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 murder and dead bodies and dismemberment. So we, but, but 
uh, kids that age, middle school, high school, were, are interested in forensics. They're interested in forensic science. So we thought it would be, um, you know, make a good, um, a good mix to use her niece and, and uh, also a good role model for, for young girls to, to, that it's cool to like, for anybody really that age, that it's cool to like science. I, I love the message and I love the idea. Um, I'm curious how you feel about your children all becoming writers, <laughs> if that's true. You know, two of them are. Two of them are. And I was uh, walking with my middle daughter, who's, uh, she teaches university uh, in a nursing program. She's got a master's degree in nursing. And she was saying, you know, I'm debating whether to go back to school and get my f physician's assistant or nurse practitioner or write a book. I think I may take a year off and write a book. So that would be three for three. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you know, I think that um, it's it's kind of tough when you have such a great example of all this can be so much fun. And, you know, I, I hope they hang out with some writers that are also struggling because it's a it's a crazy job. I don't know if I would recommend it to my kids, <laughs> but I'm so glad that it's working out. You can do it anywhere. It's, it's great. Yeah, but definitely some challenges. So before we wrap up and start taking audience questions, I just wanted to recommend once again that you guys check out this newest book. It's absolutely of this time. It's got so much detail and so much interesting research and science incorporated into it. I was riveted and I love the story. And um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the book before we open it up for questions? I think that you've covered it. I, yeah. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun. I can't wait. I have, there's a huge scrolling list of messages okay. um, from people listening in. Now I will do, I was thinking that maybe Polly was going to help us sort through some of these, but I can try to see. Um, let's see. Okay. How do you, this is a question from Miriam. Um, how do you feel about teaching forensics in a high school setting? She oh. is a teacher and um, she's taught before and she was just curious. She said applications for using bones to gather information about height or gender. Um, she's used your books in class. How do you feel about that? I think that's great. And, and there are many, many, many schools, middle schools and high schools that offer forensics and some hands-on experiences that uh, the kids love it. So I think I'm all for it. Um, I've got a couple questions coming on through here about the TV show. Um, one listener wants to know a little bit more about your involvement with the show, like how much they let you get involved with the creative process and the direction. I'm not a director. I did not direct any episodes. Um, I wrote episodes. I wrote, uh, I guess my favorite one I wrote uh, was The Dude in the Dam. That's the one where Hodgins grew the bot fly on his, on his neck. I was in the executive producer's office one day and he got a call from one of the executive producers. It, there's all these levels. Of, anyway, one of the executive producers at Fox and he, the executive producer at Fox said, that is the most disgusting thing I have ever seen. And we were so proud of that. <laughs> and then I wrote uh, The Witch in the Wardrobe, which was my, a lot of fun because that's I was given two directives where to open it up with the discovery of two sets of re remains, two skeletons, and get Angela and Hodgins together. So I decided to go ahead and have them get married. So I wrote that episode. Um, so I did write episodes. I, I worked as a producer, but mainly my function was to um, advise the writers, especially in the early seasons when they didn't know as much about the science. And they would have a lot of questions. Emily would have questions. She really took it seriously, getting everything pronunciations of all the words and everything like that by the you know eighth ninth tenth season they all probably could have sat for their boards for their master's degrees they become so conversant <laughs> in the field <laughs> i can i can imagine uh, another question it's kind of about the books and the tv show i think it's fascinating that it seems and it's it's verified in several interviews i've read of yours that tempe is loosely based on a lot of your own personal experiences. Um, you know, she lives where you've lived. She works in similar environments. Um, the TV show, I understand, is a, is a younger version, mm -hmm. um, maybe a pre, a, you know, an origin story kind of thing. Which version of Tempe do you like the best? One reader wants to know, um, Echo M. And uh, 
which one do you think is most similar to you? Oh, well, the book is more similar to me. Um, she's older in the book, um, shorter in the book. <laughs> I'm younger and <laughs> Chanel's much taller than I am. It's very demoralizing to stand and have your photograph taken next to her. I like <laughs> both. I mean, and I like the fact that they're different. Um, you know, when I, because when I go to write a, temp, I think of TV Tempe and Book Tempe, you know, and they are, there's certainly commonalities. Um, I like that both the show and the books have humor. Um, and that's a, that's tough. That's a balancing act because it's violent death every episode, every, every novel. Um, but when I go to write a book, I'm not influenced by what's going on with Tempe. That's earlier. It's maybe a prequel. It's a younger Tempe. It's a so socially more awkward Tempe. Um, but I'm writing about the book Tempe. So I, I like that. I like not being influenced um, by the TV version. But I like both versions. That would be odd, I think, to have a different version of my character out running around. That would, that would feel like a weird doppelganger. <laughs> But I'm glad it worked out. It worked out beautifully. And, and Tempe and the TV show writes a book about a doctor, Kathy Riggs. Is that correct? Yes, that was our executive producer, Hart Hansen. That was his idea to do that, that flip around, that she's a full-time forensic anthropologist by day. And in her spare time, she writes novels about a fictional anthropologist named Kathy Riggs. I love it. I think it's so clever. Um, a reader wants to know what advice you would give someone interested today in forensic anthropology. Uh, well, you have to go to university, you have to graduate, you have to get good grades so that you can get into graduate school. If you want to be a serious player, you need uh, a PhD in order to sit for your boards. Um, and then I think it's PhD and three years post PhD experience and then you can submit your candidacy and then you can take the, there's both an oral exam and a practical exam, and you can sit for your boards. Because if you, if you wanna be a real player, that's what you have to do. And the importance of board certification is that it's a way of letting um, the courts, uh, of letting law enforcement know who's a legitimate expert. Because somewhere back in the 90s, when forensic science became popular, all of a sudden, everybody was hanging out their shingles. If they had a degree in psychology, they're a forensic psychologist. And they had a degree in chemistry, they're forensic chemists kind of thing. So how do you know who the legitimate expert is? Well, they've gone through this process of board certification. So that's, it's a long haul. You know, it takes what the average for a PhD post bachelor's degree is, I think five years, and then another three and then take your boards. And my advice would be to go to a university or go to a grad program. You can go to that website I mentioned, the ABFA website, abfa.org, and find board certified anthropologists who have university programs and contact them and get yourself into one of those programs because we are a pretty small field and a lot of it is networking. You know, I have a, I'm a friend with a medical examiner and uh, here in Cuyahoga County. Because yeah. you make fun friends when you're writing about murder. <laughs> and, um, and I've had the chance to go through the morgue at the county and, and look through some of the work that they do there. And um, what struck me, though, is what a shortage there is in forensic pathologists and medical examiners, like if people who are certified to do this work, do you find that there is a shortage in, of qualified forensic anthropologists? Well, I think it depends on the geography. There are parts of the country where there are none. And then there are parts of the country where there's an overabundance because you know there's going to be a limited number of cases uh, every year, um, whereas the pathologists, you know, they're going to have a regular, steady workflow of X hundred cases that are, you know, depending on your population base, that they're going to be doing um, death investigations and autopsies of. A anthropology, it's a little more um, variable as to how many there are going to be. Yeah, I was I was kind of dismayed to hear um, across the country what a shortage of, of pathologists there are. So it's good to know that when you need bones examined, you can find somebody. <laughs> Probably. Um, one reader wants your thoughts, and it's kind of sticky, <laughs> um, on another author's work. And um, I think the author he's at, I'm asking about is James Patterson and his Women Murder Club series um, that has some anthropology facts. Um, I don't expect you to comment on James Patterson's work unless you really want to, but I'm curious if you get those types of questions a lot about the work of other authors. 
I do, not so much specifically by name. And Jim Patterson's a wonderful person. He gave me a bl he gave us a blurb for our virals book, so we're still very grateful to him for that. Um, and I, I, sadly, I have not read the the Women's Murder Club books. I should. I actually should read those. So. Um, what was the question though? The question was, do you get these questions? Do you, do you get people that want you to comment on other authors' work quite frequently? I could it, think of one in particular. It's more, who do you read? Who do you like to read? And I'm always happy to make positive comments. It's, it's pointless to make negative comments. What, that never behooves you to do that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of touch on that because, you know, if you had to list your top five writers that you will always buy their latest book, would who would be on your list? Oh gosh, you know I always go blank. Let's see, um, Michael Connolly. I do, I do like his stuff. I like Dennis Lehane. I like um, Harlan Coben. I like Karen Slaughter. Um, I love Karen. Uh, let me think. Who else? Um, Ian Rankin. I like uh, P.D. James. I used to read her stuff. Um, yeah, so. But I read all over the map. I don't just read mysteries and, and thrillers. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I find that it's really fascinating to read what's selling. So I am going through the list to see if we have caught all of our questions. They want to know, what, were any of the TV shows, um, one reader wants to know, that were inspired by true cases, like some of the books might have been? Yes. In fact, our pilot was. It was called The Lady in the Lake, and it was a, a an intern in Washington DC who had gone missing. And in our story, her remains turned up in the lake. Um, I think it was like two years after she went missing. So that was, we had what we would call our ripped from the headlines stories. And that was one of those, the missing intern. And I'll, you know, if I took a while, I could think of another one. Um, here's one from Sarah, who's been following us. Um, She's asking about the break between um, this last, most recent book and the one before it. And then it was a, a large break uh, in between the series, that Tempe's back now. Um, do you want to talk about the, the time lapse between book 18 and 19? Well, I did take a gap year. Um, I had some personal things going on and um, suddenly I had no grandkids and then I had this explosion. It was like a litter. So I got six of them. <laughs> Six? Yeah, they're yeah. They're oh all, my gosh. They're all between five and ten. So they're really close. They're the they call themselves the cousin crew. So I'm actually in isolate not isolation, but in, you know, running from COVID sort of at my beach house. And I've been here since the end of March, uh, with four of my grandkids and two of my daughters. And yeah. So I've ended up spending a lot of time with them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've been a lot of together time with our family here. I, I understand. Um, someone wants to know, Dana wants to know if you ever consult on um, active, you say you kind of stop taking new cases. Do you still consult professionally within the industry of forensic path? Um, Not so much because when, in my view, when you agree to do a consult, um, you are agreeing all the you've got to be available to see it all the way through litigation should it be a criminal situation you've got to be prepared for the fact that that case may go to trial and you know two years down the road you still have to be available or whatever length of time it takes so you know if if you look at something and you go no that's deer bones or that's chicken bones or something yeah then fine you're done but if it is a criminal case and it's human remains you it's it's a it's a long process Ken. What's the longest you've been tied up in a litigation for a single case? Oh my goodness, I'd have to think about that. Yeah, I don't know, a couple years. Some, some can go years, either because the person's not identified or because they're ultimately identified, but if it's, say, it's a homicide, nobody's caught for it. So there can be lots of different reasons that might contribute to how long or how quickly it's resolved. Uh, Megan wants to know um, how many new book ideas you've hatched since the stay-at-home orders began. Are you having a very fruitful writing time or has it been a challenge to write in quarantine? No, it's been, um, the kids are really uh, respectful of that. 
if Grancy's upstairs and I've got the doors closed, I'm in my office. Um, now what happens is I sit here, my office overlooks the beach. We're right on, on the water. And so I'll see all of them trailing out with their little beach chairs and their buckets and things like that. And I'm stuck up here writing. Um, but no, they, they honor that and they respect that. So I've gotten, I've gotten quite a bit of writing done. I've, my, my schedule is that I'll get up fairly, not crazy early, but I'll get up fairly early and then I'll just stay writing until about one o'clock and then knock off, have some lunch and go do whatever the family's doing. That's nice. So you're finishing a book that you just found out is coming out in March. So you've got to get it turned in <laughs> and you're doing a virtual book tour and you're hanging with six grandkids. Well, plus I just sold this house, which is a very, it's a, it's a very big house. So we have until the 29th. Oh, that'd be like a week to close. So we're having estate sales and we're having, you know, to go into storage because the new house that I'm building is not ready and we're having to get packers and movers and it's, it's chaos here. Oh, you're just a little bit busy. Just a little that, bit. <laughs> that's nuts. Uh, a question just came in from Terry and it actually, it's funny because my sister who loves Bones, like the show, she watches it religiously um, or did and the reruns wants to know if you've had a real Sealy Booth in your life. Uh, no, not through, mm -mm, not, not somebody I work with. No, I wish. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I work with a lot of cops, but uh, yeah, no. <laughs> well, uh, apparently he is quite fun to look at. So <laughs> thank you so much, Kathy, for taking the time out of what is an insane schedule. Right now it's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Well, I'm thinking of you. I really hope that your book finishes up nice and neat and well, and the house sale goes well, and this book tour keeps chugging along. Is there, um, one reader wanted you to say again what the name of the new book you're working on is. The Bone Code. The Bone Code, which- Get it on Amazon already. You can pre-order it, <laughs> so. Pre-order it, but before you do, make sure you check out Conspiracy of Bones. I'm going to talk it again. It's really fun. It was a really fun, fun book. And I, again, I still can't believe you went on tour and into the deep web and I would, I would have thrown away my computer. Um, it was really an edge on edge of the seat situation. So thank you again, Kathy. It was a fun read and it's been a great talk. Thank you everybody out in Ohio. Thank you so much to Kathy and to DM. These are really great questions. It was wonderful. Kathy, you're, you know, just great exciting things to learn about your life. Um, we really enjoyed having you and I want to just echo what DM said. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be here with us. Um, I know all of our community really appreciates it. So um, check out the rest of our programs and good night everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.